This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 14th of September 2022 at home in Wicklow. That happens to me, my brother Danny's birthday. Happy birthday, Danny. I know you're not listening to this because if you're a member of my family or if you're my wife, you've never listened to this podcast. <laughs> my, my father, my father listened clicked on the, the very first episode and rang me to ask how to turn it off <laughs> anyway um this week's episode is mostly about the recently departed queen of england i don't think i'd call it a tribute but she is a figure of historic uh historic interest and I thought it'd be worth spending a bit of time just looking at her, my own my own perspective, uh, putting her into a context of the Irish relationship with the United Kingdom, with England, with Britain, with the royal family. And uh, I also take a bit of time at the end of the episode to share some uh some pieces of work uh in the form of the lyrics from a particular song and the work of a couple of different poets uh who in different ways were acknowledging the 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 queen so uh there's that in the mix as well i also have a bit of time at the start of the episode to talk about the place of rhetoric around the dinner table um are in the family home so so that's what's coming up um there's quite a bit quite a bit on 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 the queen uh her legacy um my thoughts on monarchy as an institution and um some literary mentions of the queen as well so um get into it uh i hope you find it enjoyable I'll see you around the corner. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. Hi, my name is Dara Clear, and you're listening to the Clear Out. You're very welcome. How's the form today? How's she cutting? As they uh, used to say down my neck of the woods, which is um, it's it's uh, it's still my neck of the woods. There's no use to. It's very much a, a now thing. How she cutting boys? You don't hear that so much anymore. How she cutting? <laughs> um. Anyway, how is she cutting with you, my friend? As the anthropologist said to the local Wicklow man, how is she cutting today? She's cutting well, boys. So, yes, it's uh, it's 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 very autumnal, and um, I guess we should uh, should embrace that. That's that's my counsel. <laughs> that's my counsel when I'm teaching Tai Chi or um, the particular version of Qi Gong, which is a set of Qi breathing exercises fundamentally so breathing exercises exercises designed to stimulate energy flow to stimulate the internal organs to encourage the alignment and flow of your body's energy uh, and the version i learned many years ago from my karate instructor who had learned from his uh, it's called Baduan Jin, Baduan Jin, and my counsel when I'm teaching that, um, which I do every Wednesday, is to enter a receptive, witnessing, non-judgmental state of mind, to enter an accepting state of mind, and it's it's great, <laughs> it's great for that moment. It's great for that little time frame when we're in practice and we open ourselves to that 
60 minutes of of concentration of non effortful concentration it's 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 a fine line it, it, it it's 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 a cultivated discipline um but yeah it's um it's instantly calming and i access it most successfully when i teach and much less successfully in my own practice um so i'm not sure i'm not sure what that says it says i'm i'm accessing <laughs> i'm accessing a different mode of being and a different mode of being present and a different mode of being mindful in the presence of others ironically but maybe it is having an audience and leading in that sense to to demonstrate and to guide and to direct um yeah so so there you go so i encourage you in this moment to be accepting to be a witness to yourself and to be non-judgmental that is i believe a key ingredient to to being calm to being well to to surviving in in a more fluid less confrontational state and when i say confrontational i mean confrontational with yourself confrontational with one's self with oneself that is for me i find that's the that is a battle that never ceases on some level there's always a return to that battlefield where weapons are drawn or where i realize i'm under assault from within and um yeah it's uh I, i'm definitely i'm definitely trying to work through something at the moment and <laughs> my daughter challenged me yesterday what were we talking about i don't know I, I i used i said that i said i was talking to her about something oh i know what i was talking to her about i was talking to her about her her food habits her eating habits at the moment i think i may have referred to this recently but she is my wife and i are finding uh we're finding we're having a lot of battles around food and our daughter just being a bit fussy and picky now i was notoriously picky and fussy and whingy around food when i was a kid i just used to uh wish it all away <laughs> whatever would end up on my plate i just i think i just absent myself from the experience <laughs> And then hope when I finally tuned back in that somehow, miraculously, my plate would be empty and I wouldn't have to eat whatever gack had been put in front of me. And that's, uh, it is a terrible slight on uh, my mother's efforts to put food on the table. Um, but I think one of my most hated things, which I managed, I managed to avoid pretty successfully. And I think this is a, a throwback to uh, being a child of the 70s. For some deplorable reason every now and then goulash would be made goulash goulash did goulash come from hungary um i don't know what the etymology is of goulash but i can't help thinking it's very close to the word gulag and it felt like horrendous penal servitude to sit in front of a plate or bowl of goulash i couldn't even tell you what's in it i just remember i thought it was detestable <laughs> and let me tell you let me tell you my daughter is turning nine next month and i can assure you she has never been offered goulash <laughs> So that is, you know, that that is that is. I'm 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 honouring I'm I'm honouring my my childhood and my sense of no, no human should be forced to eat this. 
uh, and I certainly won't make my daughter read it, but she finds a way to, um, to to have issues with a lot of stuff that's put in front of her. And she started off so well. She was a great eater when she was she, she was smaller. Um, and yeah, it's just the, 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 the dinner just drags and drags as she sits there morosely poking at the cold remaining food on her plate. Uh, and we, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, ob- there's there's genuine concern that what she will eat, the, the list of what she'll eat, gets smaller and smaller. Um, and then I go, is it just is it just kind of the the frustration with having to, with not being able to do stuff that's convenient? So that parental frustration of, I just want to put something out, cook something quickly, throw it on the table, we'll all eat, and it's done. And then you've got this little protester, this dissident at the table going, I don't like this. I don't want this. And then you try to preempt that. So you'll go, OK, this is what we're having for dinner. What do you think of that? And then you realize you've become the modern parent who is so child centric and you're giving the child enormous power and influence. And there's a little bit of my old fashioned inclination that goes I don't want to do that you know shut up and eat up this is what you're getting you don't know how lucky you are children in and then you insert whatever random country from some impoverished part of the world are being forced to eat this children in Ukraine are eating this children in Ethiopia are eating this Uh, I try not to I try not to to drop that on my daughter because it's just such a hackneyed parental guilt trip that I don't really I don't really value and I I think children nowadays uh, are have been exposed to enough worrying factors enough impactful larger world concerns that they don't they don't need parents they don't need their their guardians the ones who care for them and are nurturing them to to add to their burden their burden of responsibility, their sense of doom. Um, think about this. Maybe let's just back off on that sort of rhetoric. There you go. There's a, there's a question. Should there be rhetoric around the dinner table? Should there be rhetoric in the household? What is rhetoric after all, other than manipulative cant, manipulative language? language designed to to be insidious to find its way under your skin and pull your levers push your buttons there's just such a dishonesty in rhetoric but it's a very effective mode of delivering a message used by great orators great playwrights writers politicians and when it's i think when it's when it's used well or perhaps used for dramatic effect or poetic effect it can be a really brilliant thing um one of the great great examples of rhetoric is uh anthony's speech to the romans in julius caesar from shakespeare um and how he turns that mob who are who are reveling in the death of the tyrant, the death of the dictator, the death of Caesar and celebrating Brutus. But Anthony's like, I'm not sure about this. And he he wins the crowd over and just does this amaze. It's an amazing piece of writing, an amazing piece of rhetoric because he just undercuts the validity of Brutus's, um, Brutus and the cabal. Shout out to the cabal, by the way. Brutus and the cabal of senators, he undercuts the validity of their actions by interjecting with the story of what has happened. But Brutus is a noble man. They did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. Caesar did this, Caesar was this. The great leader was this. But Brutus is a noble man. And it's, ah, oh, I yeah, I love it. It's just, it's just superb. And 
particularly because Anthony has to stand up and convince this rabid crowd, talk them down and get past their emotion. Get past their emotion, get through the frenzy to... And what Anthony is trying to do, like he's trying to speak to something of conscience, speak to a sense of morality. Um, and it's brilliant. So maybe revisit, revisit that and see what you think. Um, yes, so I was talking to my daughter the other day, yesterday or the day before, and I said, oh, your mum and I are very, uh, we're just very concerned at the moment about the way you're, you know, having a, you know, having a, just a drama with food every night at dinner. And my daughter, as children do, took that very literally. You mean like now? What do you mean at the moment, right now? I'm eating my dinner now. And I was trying to go, no, I mean like recently, of late. <laughs> and you get into a language discussion. Um, so what I was saying about myself is that I'm definitely trying to work through something at the moment. By which I mean recently of late in my own life i just feel i'm negotiating some thing internally that has me slightly off kilter and i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not having a, a depressive episode it's different the 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 tenor of it is different it's um, it's something i'm trying to get my my head around it's definitely existential it's definitely something to do with being in my late 40s. It's definitely connected to my marriage. It's definitely connected to what I'm doing in my life. There are doubts, there are concerns, there are insecurities. There is a self-interrogation in place. Um, and I'm just trying to stay chilled and wait until I can kind of grasp what it is that's really unsettling me and disturbing me and just leaving me feeling ill at ease and there's a there's a huge there's a huge element a great big dollop of doubt in the mix and I'm trying to to quiet that but I'm trying to look at it honestly I I, I try to I try to watch out for the pitfall of denial <laughs> Denial and delusion. Uh, of course, they they can be they can be great uh, tools on the road to success. Um, to, to shut out the uh, to shut out the things that would make you to, that would make you stop. To 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 shut out um, the the deterrence and proceed on your path unconcerned. <laughs> Um, but there's a there's a middle ground as always there's a middle ground to try and to try and be real um, and know when a change might need to be implemented and sometimes that change is only a change of thinking a change of perspective but I'm definitely I'm definitely finding myself dragging weight at the moment and it's affecting my my productivity it's affecting my my motivation it's affecting my resolve and that makes me unwell it drives me mad so i want to get on top of that um so yeah so sometimes it's good to take a break from looking at myself <laughs> yeah stating the obvious 101 um so we will look elsewhere now in today's episode and this may, um, this will, this will recall um, or speak to what I was just saying a moment ago about the, 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 the speech from Julius Caesar, the death of the leader, the death of the dictator, the monarch, the, the tyrant, um, the, the, the emperor in Caesar's case. Of course, there's been, there's been a bereavement. There's been a bereavement um, next door in in the last week. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II passed away at the ripe old age of 96. And the media, particularly, of course, the British media has been has been full of it. And 
I have been looking at my own thoughts about her passing, um, the the relationship, of course, historically the relationship between between Ireland and England, between Ireland and the United Kingdom, between Ireland and the Empire is, how shall we put it, fractious, tense, oppressive, bloody, um, steeped in animosity, mistrust. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of those relationships the big power and the no power, the big power and the small power, the big country and the small country, um, the bristling, the bristling neighbors, and the that relationship. I've certainly, I certainly feel in my lifetime, it's been fascinating to watch Ireland shed a lot of its post-colonial chips from its shoulders to to cast off a certain insecurity and self-doubt um, in terms of our national identity and our sense of self as as a country as a culture um, as a people I found growing up there was much more there was much more obvious um a much more obvious comparison that went on between us and the English from you know from our side the, the I think the English largely didn't give us a huge amount of thought um they yeah I, I yeah that, that, like that and again having you know having spent some time in England uh ha- having lived there in the mid 90s when I went to acting school um I got a very clear sense of the poverty of most English people's grasp of the history between our two countries. Um, there was just just um, staggering amounts of ignorance, huge gaps in 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 the knowledge of what had transpired over hundreds of years between between England and Ireland, um, between every. English uh, establishment um, and government um, which 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 you know which in Irish school which in Irish schools certainly when I was in school it's such a huge component of Irish history that relationship the the the, the struggle historically to to cast out the occupying forces to cast out the oppressors uh, the different uh, movements of revolution and rebellion, the different, the different means through which that outcome was pursued through politics, through diplomacy, through violence, uh, through activism, through guerrilla warfare. Um, and that 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 sense of needing to assert ourselves and to to truly stand alone stand independently and keep that separation and assert that right to to govern ourselves to be a sovereign power. I think that was very much part of the, the the political mentality and ideology, regardless of which party was in charge in in Ireland, and the the complication of the Northern Ireland question, the the the, the border, the outbreak of the troubles um in 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 the 60s uh, which was brought about by massive um institutionalized injustice um and discrimination against the the catholic communities in parts of northern ireland um and the 
the disregard from the the British government for that issue um, led to the events that that really were the the um, that lit the fuse on on the conflict that became the troubles the 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 the, 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 the rolling conflict and terrorist war between the Irish Republican Army and various factions of the IRA between the British military, the RUC, various loyalist paramilitary groups um, who were in collusion with British establishment forces. Um, that, that, I mean, that was, that, that was and kind of continues to be this very messy hangover um, and messy, messy legacy of, of British occupation. And it's, it's something that still is, is relevant today because of, uh, of Brexit, because of the, the, the community of Ulster unionists whose allegiances still are to the, the United Kingdom, to the British monarchy, to that heritage, that history. And um, that's, that's something that still, uh, you know, it, it remains to be seen how, that, how that's going to play out in, 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 in the future. Um, I, uh, I personally, and I may, I may be way off the mark here, but I personally believe we will be looking at, a, uh, at uh, an Ireland without that border at some point. Um, uh, I expect that to happen in my lifetime. It may happen sooner rather than later. I don't know how unionists feel up north about the... They've been victims of this lack of knowledge of Irish history. They've been victims of the ignorance of of English leadership. Um, particularly, like it, it, everything got very exposed around the time of Brexit um, and the the colossal, and I use the word again, ignorance, the colossal ignorance of the, the Tory party um, in terms of their their just their misunderstanding or their 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 willful misunderstanding or lack of interest in understanding the complexity of Northern Irish politics, Northern Irish identity, and the thorniness of that. Um, and you just think in a way, and again, now I'm gonna get into very uncertain territory. I can't help but feeling in a way that Northern Irish Unionists would actually get a better serve, a better deal from uh, an, an Irish establishment on the whole island. Because at least I think there is a true understanding and knowledge of the history. And I feel even from politicians who would be diametrically opposed uh, politically speaking, to the unionist ideals, uh, that would be Sinn Féin, the, the political party that was always the, the kind of political face of the IRA. Like even there, I feel there'd be concessions at this stage. Um, and that was evident last week on the passing of the Queen, where politicians from that party were acknowledging the that bereavement um, and how that would impact and be felt um, in the unionist community up north. But um, in any case, I, the point I was trying to get to was that I feel that in my lifetime, that relationship and the prickliness around the relationship between Ireland and England, it just got less and less prickly, uh, particularly through the Celtic Tiger years when Ireland suddenly found itself brimming over with confidence culturally, economic confidence and um, enjoying its position as this enormously buoyant um, country culture uh, through the through the 90s into the early 2000s, the property boom, 
the the country has felt awash with money or maybe more accurately awash with credit uh, based on confidence of course as economies often are um and it was just a i can i think there was a now this is a word i don't know how to pronounce i, I wanted to say <laughs> is it slough S L O U G H. How do you pronounce that? It means like to throw off, like to throw off a skin. And I feel that that is that's the word. That's the that, that's the correct word. Is it sloughing? Sloughing? I'm going to I'm going to check the pronunciation of that because I see it. I understand what it means. Um, but how in God's name do you pronounce that word? Slough. I think it is slough. Sloughing pronunciation. Let's see what my friend Mr. Google says. Slough. Sloughing. Sloughing. <laughs> I'll see if you can catch this. Sloughing. Sloughing. That's nice English pronunciation. Sloughing. That's slow. Now. Sloughing. Oh no, that's slow. Sloughing. Sloughing, sloughing off. What's the American pronunciation sound like? Do you ever do this? This is available to you on, on Google. Just put in your word and pronunciation and they'll give you British and American, uh, British English and American English pronunciation options. So the Americans say... Sloughing. Sloughing. Sloughing off. Sloughing off the coat of colonialism in Ireland. So... Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. Like, I feel that that's what happened uh, through the 90s, particularly. Uh, now, don't forget, the 90s also saw the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, this was the, you know, the, fundamentally the part of the, the peace process and the peace treaty, for want of um, that, that, that word wasn't really used as such. You know, it's called the Good Friday Agreement, which was a way of settling the conflict in Northern Ireland. Um, was that 1998 at the end? Um, again, I spoke about I spoke about this uh, last year. I did a whole episode on the the complexity of post conflict uh, settlements and treaties and peace and reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, forgiveness. Um, that was quite a good episode, I think. I was looking at South Africa, Northern Ireland, and some of the documents around the, the 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 settlements and processes that happened on the other side of those bloody brutal horrific conflicts really uh, but anyway i feel ireland through that through the 90s um with an emergent sense of success an emergent sense of 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 self of of national pride and you know this was very much connected also to certain artistic achievements the success of a band like u2 the success of artists like Sinead o'connor um certain actors and directors maybe people like gabriel byrne liam neeson directors like neil jordan um river dance of all things would have played a role i remember when river dance emerged as the the halftime entertainment uh, during that particular Eurovision Song Contest. Um, and it was something that had an energy and a vibrancy, uh, regardless of its artistic merits or its musical merits. There was something about it that was, um, I don't know if it, there was just this kind of bombastic, modernized, high octane interpretation of of a certain flex of Irish music and Irish dancing that just kind of blew people's heads off. Um, and that was around the time also that we just seemed to be routinely winning the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, that was also the time when tech investment in Ireland was starting to happen in a very major way. Intel had been in Ireland for a few years at that stage. It's now a huge, huge complex on its original site just out near... Uh, Maynooth University, where I went to university. I uh, drove past it the other week. I was out visiting a friend. But um, all of that stuff, all of that stuff was there. And um, not to mention the success, relatively speaking, <laughs> of the Irish soccer team 
um again 90s the 90s there was something and coming out of the the kind of the the recession of the 80s the 80s was a particularly brutal time with the troubles as well just no end in sight and hunger strikes and horrific horrific massacres and brutal killings um and okay and to try and bring it back to where i'm getting to where I'm not sure the royal family featured that much. They didn't feature that much in my thinking. I was aware as a kid, you saw the, the wedding of Charles and Diana. Um, and I, I, was, I just would have been kind of indifferent. And then the, uh, I can't remember which brother, was it Andrew and was it Fergie? And we don't mean, she didn't marry Alex Ferguson. It was, uh, you know, the Man United manager, Sarah Ferguson. There was that one as well. And I, I I couldn't tell you what the level of interest was here in Ireland. I remember being aware of it. I remember it being on TV. It certainly wasn't something we would have been fixating on in our household. I mean, guess I guess some of my mother's uh, women's magazines that were coming into the house would have had some of that coverage as well. Um, but I never had huge thoughts on the royal family. I just, I don't know. They were just there in the background um, I would have been more aware of the political face of England, people like Margaret Thatcher, um, the sort of her politics, the alignment of her politics and Ronald Reagan's politics, uh, and certainly in our household, which was more left leaning, there would have been critis- you know, would have been a critical view. Um and I think the the right the the rightness of that position uh, has been borne out. Um, I was aware of. I feel I I feel I was aware of coal miners striking in the north of England. Thatcher's lack of regard, and that that lack of regard. I think that's that that would that would have been a key note of what I felt growing up in terms of how England regarded Ireland. A lack of regard, a sort of aloofness, a disdain, um, and th- those are all kind of neutral enough positions. Um, and I think at worst there was actual derision and a sense of being patronised and looked down on. Um, and certainly a sense and this would be and, and i've spoken about this before that there would have been this, that 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 the, the maybe maybe more than remnants but there would have been still that sense of how the irish had been depicted in the 1800 in the 1800s in political cartoons as being sort of ape like creatures subhuman um primal animalistic um not especially intelligent um base creatures and yeah th- yeah I, I mean even and anytime i revisit that i just feel like f you just get away from me uh, and particularly that sense would have been reinforced when i eventually found myself living in england and realized that Certainly the, amongst my contemporaries over there, they just hadn't a clue about the history between our two countries. Um, there was just a sort of a, a shorthand, offhand way of regarding Ireland. And a lot of it was tied up with malarkey and leprechauns and that sort of shite. Um, <laughs> and I just felt, oh, good luck. You're so dim. God love you. You haven't a clue. And it took a lot of the heat out of it in a way because you're just going, all right, you really you haven't been educated and you're sort of clueless. And you're there's a there's a sort of a, a blithe um, certitude in many English people um, and a sort of an unthinkingness uh, and, an, and an assumption that they were great. <laughs> And I was like, go and pick up some history books from other countries, from, um, you know, everywhere that, the you know, the British Empire has been. 
and start thinking about what you've done. And um, I think ultimately that brings us to where we are now because Brexit is an indication of, in my opinion, chronic national insecurity, a crisis of national identity, absolute hysterical panic from the most regressive elements in British governance, uh, some very disingenuous, um, some very disingenuous and enormously privileged politicians like Nigel Farage, like David Cameron, um, these, oh, and the other, oh, the other Egypt, um, the beanpole with the glasses who feels like he, he, he should be, I don't know, he should be um, Winston Churchill's cigar cutting aid. Um, what's his name? Oh, I've just gone blank. He's a total plonker. Oh, what was his dad a milkman? Is that is that his? Is that going to be the thing that is you know works to his eternal shame? Um, oh, the double-barreled, bespectacled, beanpole, Egypt. He's in the mix as well. I've just gone blank in his name. It'll come to me, or it won't. But in any case, what we have now with the Queen passing away. England has lost this totemic figure, this figure that represented the ultimate stability, the ultimate constancy of the status quo, and this figure who didn't seem to to deviate from a certain position of, yes, regal poise. And certainly listening to the the response in Irish media last week, many, many Irish commentators were citing her 2011 visit to Ireland, which was the first time we'd had a state visit from a ruling British monarch in a hundred years um, and it was an enormous success and she, the, the Queen was at an official dinner with the the President of Ireland and other Irish dignitaries, politicians and she began her address to the attendees with a few words of Irish, speaking the Irish language. Um, and I remember the Irish president at the time, Mary McAleese, did a sort of a jaw drop double take, which I, I, I remember feeling very critical of that. Um, it, 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 yeah, anyway, whatever. I, I don't know. I just kind of thought sometimes I just didn't. Yeah, I just felt it was a a very ostentatious, um, strange response indicative of um, an obsequiousness and um, a sort of cap in hand humility that I didn't feel was very uh, statesmanlike of the president at the time. But in any case, the Queen... The Queen charmed the pants off us, let's put it that way, and made a lot of friends and did a lot of did a lot of good work to kind of put a cap on on the past to an extent, to an extent. Like let's not forget it, it, it's a diplomatic role. Um and yet there was a willingness to receive her. There was a, a happiness for her to be here. Now I was in Australia at the time watching from from those shores um, and speaking of Australia I remember one time <laughs> my father-in-law we, he was down visiting us uh, in, in Melbourne and there was something about the Queen on the news and he made he was kind of he was kind of winding me up but uh, he was kind of like you know you need to you know they're talking about the Queen uh, you need to stand up um, and I just said she's not my Queen um, and remained firmly in my seat thanks very much um, 
But I think my own feelings really when I was just reflecting on the longevity of her reign and the the historical events she lived through as queen are quite phenomenal to to come to you know to come to be on the throne in 1952 just after the the war britain would have been in a a state of rebuilding itself um with no little help from the Irish, by the way. Um, huge numbers of Irish people came over to help rebuild Britain um, after the war. I remember an ex-girlfriend of mine um, who I met when I was in acting school in England, her grandmother confessing that she was scared of the Irish when they came over to rebuild the roads um, after the war. Um, and I think maybe the English had that impression of us the um you know the wild men the wildness of the irish um but i think most irish people are very proud of that idea that we're a bit wild and a bit untamed and i think that that would be a very key point of distinction culturally and certainly in terms of how the irish see themselves um and our own sense of self that there is something that we still celebrate uh, at the heart of who we are and it's part of our pagan history there is a wildness um now i don't want to overstate that or over romanticize it the way i interpreted it certainly after 10 years in australia which culturally has a lot of things in common with 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 england as well as other obvious influences i just felt when i was living away that i, I missed the Irish ability to to let go of stuff to just enjoy themselves and it's not about being frivolous or unserious um, but it's an ability to just go now now's the time to to party uh, now's the time to to celebrate now's the time to set aside our concerns and enjoy this evening or, or this gig or this event um, now is the time to express ourselves to to be amongst each other to communicate to connect it's not it's not and it's not necessarily tethered to drink although that can be a huge component of that um, it's there is something there there is something there about a culture that survived um, huge adversity um, and huge cultural oppression um and the english were very much the the instigators of that oppression and they actively sought to um and this was a, a colonial weapon a weapon of colonization they sought to make irish culture illegal expressions of the irish language illegal and it's an it's an invalidation. It's a it's a strategy. It's a it's a it's a it's it's a tool of warfare to invalidate the the culture, the identity of those who are occupied. Um, and the British Empire were not were not exclusive in that regard. It wasn't just something they they did go through history, and um, you'll find incidents instances of that. That there is a word I'm always tripping over instance and incident but they're, they're kind of complementary um in any case ultimately my feeling last week was was one of a feeling my feeling was one of respect i suppose to go well okay you're the queen and there's enormous privilege um but there's also enormous there's an there's enormous restraint with that as well is there not um the, the the conditions of the role the obligations of the role the expectations of the role and then also to be to be a young woman uh in the 50s queen notwithstanding you're surrounded by men of power um and having to negotiate that um 
Now, that, I, so, I, so I, I don't know. I look at her and I go, okay, well, you deserve respect in a way for walking the walk. Um, and maybe, and again, I'm not a student of the royal family. I'm not a student of Queen Elizabeth. Um, I'm no historian, but my sense is she was a woman who moved with the times and had a sort of an intelligence and a sensitivity to to the moment, to the cultural moment. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not here to, to eulogize her. And I'm going to get to that because I'm very interested in how these moments are marked. And I'm very interested in the idea of what a totem represents. And I am hope I'm not... I'm hoping that's not a misnomer, but um, I I certainly have found it interesting in, in, in the last kind of 15 or 20 years to see how the royal family has been depicted in popular media. And I think this probably started with Stephen Freer's movie, The Queen, where Helen Mirren, did she, I think she won an Oscar for that role, did she? Where Helen Mirren played Queen Elizabeth at a very particular moment in her life, which was just after um, Princess Diana, Lady Diana, had been killed in that car crash in Paris in, I think that was 96, was it? Um, and they the movie shows the Queen negotiating her death, negotiating the expectation of the people, negotiating new Prime Minister in, in, in Tony Blair, and Helen Mirren gives this great humanizing performance. This is the this is you know this is the actor's gift, um, and of course a writer's gift to to humanize, um, yeah, to humanize these these out of reach figures. Now that continued. You had Meryl Streep depicting Margaret Thatcher in. I haven't watched the movie. Is it The Iron Lady? Is that what it's called? But, you know, having seen clips and read reviews, again, another humanizing portrayal of this, this figure, this enormously divisive figure in, in British politics, this, you know, face of horrendous political positions, you know, privatization, uh, someone who wanted to smash trade unions, someone who evidently cared so little for you know normal working people the sort of the, you know the bastion of that tory disregard and classist superiority um and then yeah let's get meryl streep to portray her and go ah sure margaret wasn't she she was just you know she you know, she, she was a, she was a tricky girl but you know she she was just she was just another woman like the rest of us you know um, and then it continues with the, with the Netflix show the the Crown, and it's all about humanizing these people, humanizing these figures, making them more accessible, making them warm and cuddly, making them more relatable. Now, that's grand. I have no, I've a very little interest. I haven't watched it. I didn't watch the Iron Lady. I didn't watch the Crown. Um, and my feeling, my, my you know, I, what I think is. That is indicative of those subjects being less powerful in the consciousness. It's indicative of those those subjects coming, being brought down from the perch because now it's okay to make stories about them and now it's okay to just treat them like any other historical figures of interest. Uh, whereas I think at a certain time in the not too distant past, it would have been considered, no, you, you know, you leave them where they are. And for me, that, it, that, that was kind of the beginning of the, the end of the end of the mystique and the end of the untouchability of the mystique of the royal family of that aspect of British power, and it, it it's sort of a it's it's a removal or a 
a relegation of of the status um even though they were still enjoying the same level of actual power and economic power and all the rest and certainly now as you look across if you're in ireland and you're looking across the irish sea and seeing what's happening in england and looking at all of these events and all the the pomp and ceremony attached to the passing of a british monarch and the coffin lying in state uh, moving from balmoral to edinburgh moving from edinburgh down to um down to i think buckingham palace and i suppose ultimately the funeral will be in westminster next week um and at the same time you have the coronation of um i don't i'm sorry i don't know if he's actually been coronated but you have the son charles ascending the throne so now we have king charles um and he is already doing the rounds amongst the people um and has even been to our shores he was up in belfast and the irish president uh went and met him there charles is a funny one um i guess this is what he's been waiting for his entire life and he's always seemed a bit um (laughs) i don't know a bit no it does ineffective come to mind i don't know he just seems like this cliche of an aristocrat um concerned with his estate and i I don't mean his uh, what he's been bequeathed the you know what he's he stands to inherit but i mean like his his land and his trees he's always been sort of green leaning um and interested in the the curation and the uh the salvation of british um the the artifacts of 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 british physical culture i suppose buildings and um the the natural resources of of the united kingdom um so uh he just feels like he he feels very apolitical and i guess the monarchy is always meant to be apolitical in a way um and yet for someone like me who fundamentally views the idea of monarchy as absurd and immoral i mean it's the ultimate um the the ultimate generational privilege um that doesn't just bring money but brings enormous power and 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 status um and then the idea going back to kind of the victorian age in in england or maybe it was earlier this idea of the chain of being uh, that maybe the king or you know the monarch sits closest to god and it, it's 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 linear it's a hierarchy and down at the bottom you have the common working man the common working woman and it set in place the idea of of know your place know your role you certain people are born to rule and certain people are born to serve and that idea is is hard wired hard baked into the british consciousness i believe having spent time living there um and i one one sort of anecdotal um implication or example of that i remember working on building sites in london um like many irish people before me uh in the the late 90s and i was always fascinated like you'd be sitting around the the um you know the cabin the tea room um on, at break and these really working class english guys would be referring to the prime minister who at that time was tony blair and they'd, they'd all be referring to him as mr blair while they're talking about everything else that those guys would talk about um with every expletive and racial slur under the sun being bandied about um but it was always mr blair uh which i thought was indicative of that subject mentality um but then you come over here and i think the one of the consequences one of the products of resisting colonialism uh in ireland has been that 
a, a healthy disregard for status and a healthy disregard for authority and a presumption of of humanizing those who have arrived at higher stations in life and um and that's why probably on a less serious level last week um at a, a football game in in dublin um i think uh, it, was, it was shamrock rovers their fans the day the queen died they had a chant rolling right away that day which was very simply and succinctly lizzie's in a box and um it was a friend from australia who uh a friend in Sydney who actually bumped me a little video clip of these football fans just chanting Lizzie's in a box, Lizzie's in a box. And my initial reaction was kind of like, ah, oh, Jesus, lads, would you <laughs> just give it a rest? I just felt, I'm very, personally, I'm very suspicious. You don't mess with the dead. Uh, and particularly, um, you know, the, the dead, dead people who are of such enormous significance to so many. I just think it's bad mojo. Just like flag burning and burning effigies um i always feel nothing good can come of it and i think uh you walk a you kind of stay on the high ground and i also think that it's it 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 it, it, it's a reflection of greater uh security in oneself and greater security in one's identity when you don't have to score points against your enemy and my feeling is for for many Irish people, the relationship between us and England and between us and the Queen or the Royals, it's just moved beyond that kind of point scoring and that kind of easy jab. Now, almost a week later, I can look at that chant and I, I sort of see the funny side uh, based on what I was just saying about the healthy disregard for authority. Um because I did, I saw some headline yesterday where an English football fan, um, I think from uh, a fan of Preston, must be Preston North End, that football club in England. It, it, that I, I didn't see if it was he or she, but this football fan has been banned for life from the club because he put up some anti, uh, some comments against the Queen on Twitter, and he's been banned for life from the football club. I'm like, ah, oh, here lads, come on. But that shows you again the the state of English national identity at the moment, how how fragile it is and how insecure it is. Because when you see the desire for such control, it's a product of fear. You know, think about that. You know, the desire for control is a response to fear it's a response to anxiety it's a response to uncertainty because you're trying to make something solid and rigid and locked in that can't be shaken and i think you know the tory party that's what they represent and sure look they've gone and appointed um this this decade's answer to margaret thatcher in liz truss um best of luck to them with that uh, again no good can come of that i believe but um, in any case, uh, you know, best of luck to the Queen. Uh, I wish her well wherever she goes now. Uh, um, in her box, in Lizzie's box. That's um, there. There might be a poem in that. Um, but you think about this: the amount, the amount of money being spent on all of these events in England. The amount of money being spent uh, on all of the events, the security, uh, all of it being televised, the money involved in moving uh, the Queen's remains around the country and everything that's going on, everything that's going on with Charles. I'd love to see the final tally by the time you get to the end of next week's seven days of mourning for the Queen. I'd love to see the final cost of all of that and then to put that into context of <clears throat> excuse me of the economic hardship that so many people in england are facing at the moment because of rising energy costs because of rising food costs so you've got like food poverty and fuel poverty and energy poverty in england as is happening over here as well in ireland and you think here's a good way to spend a huge amount of money for the queen 
And imagine if the royal family or the British government said, you know what, we're just going to have a little quiet uh, family only ceremony for the Queen and all the money that we would have spent on these these events, these public events, uh, we're going to pump into food programs or we're going to pump into um, uh, an energy handout um to every household in the fam- in the country that sort of thing um but there you go i mean the the, the english the, the the tories and the royal family they're not exactly they're not exactly left wing are they um so anyway the um the idea then of what does that mean when a totem falls where does that leave you in what way are you now unmoored that is that is not insignificant stuff because these are the things you depend on to make sense of your world. And I think it's going to be huge. The implications of the Queen passing, it's going to be huge for English culture in, in, the, in the near future. But what I'd like to finish with today, I'm going to give you a few, um, a few responses to, to the Queen, uh, both while she was alive and now that she's passed, from different creative sources particularly songwriters and poets and i'm going to see what you what you make of these so um yeah so let's let's have a let's have a look at a few different things here it's a very uh, particular thing uh, acknowledging a public life and acknowledging a, a public figure through song or or poetry or art i mean i suppose portraiture is there's a huge tradition of that and certainly one of the things i did last week was look at a sort of photo chronology of uh, of queen elizabeth which was fascinating purely from a a fashion point of view and to see someone moving through the years one but well, a couple of images stood out one of of uh of her standing with the the kennedys with jfk and and, and jackie uh, and I suppose Philip was there as well in in a, a fine gown and again it was just a reminder of, of the length of her her reign and then another one of her uh, with oh I think it was she must have been visiting Africa and just surrounded by African children and that more than anything I think hit me with the sort of the colonial legacy um and there was something else extraordinary i read last week how in her capacity as head of the commonwealth that there there's actually a significant number of countries that are members of the british commonwealth um and it accounts for almost a third of the world's population so um that's another that's another area of her significance um, and what she meant to a lot of different people. So it's interesting when artists and writers take it upon themselves to, 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 to try and capture something of, of the Queen or speak to what the Queen represents uh, for better or worse. Because, of course, it's easy for us, and certainly I've been, I'm guilty of this at times, it's easy to think... Oh, everyone in England loves the Queen. Everyone in England, uh, everyone in the United Kingdom loves their Queen, loves the royal family, loves monarchy, loves what that represents. But of course, that's patently untrue. There's a great tradition of of protest. Uh, there's a great tradition of uh, probably, if not Republican leanings, um, insofar as wanting to have a republic as opposed to a monarchy. Um, there's, there's a, I think, a great recognition amongst many in England of the the absurdity or the irrelevance of the monarchy and the what um what what it indicates about the 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 gap in terms of of privilege and what it says about the gap in terms of the experience of um many many English people uh, or many many subjects of the crown on English shores and the the experience of members of the the royal family i mean in in a way 
you think of a show like Spitting Image, you think of political, you know, caricatures uh, and cartoons and how they've been figures of fun and, and ridicule for, 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 for years, um, as well as, uh, as figures of, of reverence and adulation. But, but look, as I say, I, w- I want to finish today just with some, some bits of writing and some tributes that I found uh, interesting um, of merit um, and that maybe capture to a tiny extent the, the, the cross section of views. Um, there's a, actually, there's a song, I'll start very, very quickly, and this is very, there's very little in this. But there's an album by the Welsh band Catatonia from about 20 years ago. Uh, is it Keris? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. Keris or Saris Matthews was the lead singer. This sort of um, punky indie pop band uh, had some great tracks. But one of her songs is Storm the Palace. And mostly that's, you know, that, that, that comprises the lyric of the song, Storm the Palace, Storm the Palace. It's repeated multiple times. And then it's interjected with a, a quick couplet um, after after the various iterations of Storm of the Palace. Uh, so you get these lines like, turn it into a bar, make them work at spar. Turn it into flats, make them all expats. Um, were they the only two? Uh, oh, stick, stick on an OBE, I'll turn your bad feng shui. And the, the, the sort of the reason to storm the palace is um because tourism is congestion um so i'm, I'm not sure about that uh, <laughs> the, the the conclusion or the reason the the cause to get into the palace to storm the palace but of course you know that's the great that's the great act of revolution you think of storming the bastille uh, in the french revolution storm the palace um nothing nothing speaks of rest of rest of populace um more than the storming of the, the 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 bastions of privilege the bastions of exclusivity so that'll be uh, that'll be a day when you know it's over if you see um the palace being stormed and that was from 20 years ago um and that you know seek out that track it's more the energy of it that will amuse you than than anything else um and here is one that's more respectful there's a, an english poet called ruth stacy and she wrote a book uh, about seven years ago where she tried to express uh, the viewpoint of monarchs. Um, I'm not sure if she only focused on queens uh, of England historically, but each poem was their viewpoint. And she had this one about Elizabeth II, which I thought was quite nice and succinct. Um this is it. In today's correspondence, a poetry book detailing the lives of British queens with a note enclosed and a question. What does it mean to be a queen? I could reply and say, this precious stone set in a silver sea, a symbol like a banner for men's love. But these are not my words. I could reply and say, glorying in the glories of my people, sorrowing with the sorrows of the lowest. But these are not my words. I could declare that each queen is tissue paper thin, translucent but combined, are my flesh. But I will not solidify my words. Instead, I will command my secretary to write with many kind thanks for the little book, etc. But to say my thoughts on queenship can only be ascertained by my actions. I quite like that. That's um, it's very kind of to the point. Um, so there's that, which is very evidently respectful. But listen to this one. I thought this is gas. This is from a song. Um, And this song is called On Her Silver Jubilee by Leon Russelson. Uh, It's quite long. Leon Russelson, who I only just came across when I was trying to look up some stuff about this today, is an English 
a writer, children's author and folk singer, writer. And I think he wrote this, well, he wrote this song on her Silver Jubilee. So that would have been 1977. And it's a a very jaunty folk song. There's kind of a satirical and protest aspect to it, which I thought was very nice. There's lines like uh, slime exuding daily from the sycophantic slugs um, and the coronation ashtrays and the coronation mugs and the rows of urban mummies with their maggot-eaten brains. All the swarms of bloated blowflies the majestic turd sustains. <laughs> he's not pulling his punches. He's uh, he's still alive. He's um, he's not a young man anymore. He was born in 1934. But here, I'm going to le- read you the... Um, one of the uh, the last verses from that song. And as I say, it's called On Her Silver Jubilee by Leon Russelson. And um, yeah, his, his chorus, uh, I'll come back to that. Well, I'll finish with the chorus, but here, this is, this is the last verse, which I thought was quite nice. She seems so commonplace a woman in her fuddy-duddy hats. But she doesn't stand in bus queues or live in high-rise flats. She doesn't ride the rush hour or cycle down the strand. And she doesn't play maracas in the Ivy Benson band. And she doesn't shop for bargains. She's never on the dole. And if she does the football pool, she doesn't tell a soul. And she doesn't need to bother with the inland revenue. Though she's royally rewarded for the things she doesn't do with palaces and properties, and to keep her in good cheer, her working wage of £1.7 million a year. Her royal plane, her royal train, a costly royal yacht, and lucrative investments in only God knows what. Oh, the magic of the monarchy, the mystery sublime, growing gracefully and effortlessly richer all the time. She's the rock of hope and glory in the quicksand of despair. For although the pound may tumble, although panic fills the air, although government may crumble and the cupboards nearly bare, though the stairs begin to rattle and the rats begin to stare, she enfolds in mystic unity her subjects everywhere, and we know we're safe from harm while Nanny's there. That's brilliant. I love it. And the chorus, with a glass cage around her and an absence in her eyes, And the regiments around her, they can't take her by surprise. She's as poised as a picture. She's a sight for all to see. With a glass cage around her on her silver jubilee. With a glass glass cage around her, she feels free. So, uh, yeah, I love that. Leon Rosselson on her silver jubilee. Go and find that. That's a song, by the way, but I thought it was worth looking at those lyrics. And... I mean, there's others. I mean, there's the Sex Pistols, God Save the Queen. There's uh, the Beatles, Her Majesty. A lot of cute stuff like that. But here's an interesting one. Um, Simon Armitage is uh, an English poet. He's the Poet Laureate. And he... He's only about 10 years um, older than me. I think he's uh, in his late 50s. But he, to me, was always a very interesting poet. He just had this great irreverence and energy and sparkiness in his poetry that I always really really liked and of course with with um, with becoming uh with becoming the, the poet laureate uh, that that that's a, a serious status bestowed on one it's like when it's it, it, it can bring a, a seriousness and a self-seriousness or a sense of doing the honorable respectable thing uh you see this with actors after they've won the academy award for best acting they they often become drawn to very serious um you know more honorable work um that can be far less interesting than the stuff they used to do before they had reached the lofty the lofty heights of academy award acclaim so just to give you an idea now i'm going to read two poems i'm going to finish with that um simon armitage uh, one of a poem of his i love is one he wrote 30 years ago um and it's called, is it called Hitcher or The Hitcher? I'm going to read you that to give you a sense of, um, to give you a sense of his tone and his style. Um, and then compare it with the poem he just wrote for the Queen. And then I'll, then I'll shoot off. This is called Hitcher. It was written in 1993 by Simon Ar- Armitage. 
I'd been tired under the weather. But the answer phone kept screaming, one more sick note, mister, and you're finished, fired. I thumbed a lift to where the car was parked, a Vauxhall Astra, it was hired. I picked him up in Leeds. He was following the sun from west to east with just a toothbrush and the good earth for a bed. The truth, he said, was blowing in the wind or round the next bend. I let him have it on the top road out of Harrogate, once with the head, then six times with the crook lock in the face and didn't even swerve. I dropped it into third and leant across to let him out and saw him in the mirror bouncing off the curb, then disappearing down the verge. We were the same age, give or take a week. He'd said he liked the breeze to run its fingers through his hair. It was twelve noon. The outlook for the day was moderate to fair. Stitch that, I remember thinking. You can walk from there. That is a poem I love. <laughs> and I thought, Simon Armitage, you're great. The irreverence, the, uh, the, the, the brutality, the dark humour. I just thought it was fantastic. But here, let's finish with this. This is Simon Armitage and a poem he just wrote for the Queen on her passing. Um, it's called Floral Tribute and it is an acrostic poem. So the first letter of each uh, of each line, when read vertically, spells the name Elizabeth. And there are two verses. So you see Elizabeth twice. And it's rather nice and very, um, yeah, it's quite, it's very evocative of something um, to do with how he perceived the Queen or if he's trying to speak for the people, which may be the, floor, the poet laureate's role. So listen to this, we'll conclude with this. This is called Floral Tribute. Evening will come, however determined the late afternoon. Limes and oaks in their last green flush pearled in September mist. I have conjured a lily to light these hours, a token of thanks. Zones and auras of soft glare framing the brilliant globes. A promise made and kept for life. That was your gift. Because of which, here is a gift in return. Glove wart to some. Each shining bonnet guarded by stern lance-like leaves. The country loaded its whole self into your slender hands, hands that can rest now, relieved of a century's weight. Evening has come, rain on the black locks and dark Munros, lily of the valley, a namesake almost, a favourite flower interlaced with your famous bouquets, the restrained zeal and forceful grace of its lanterns, each inflorescence, a silent bell disguising a singular voice. A blurred new day breaks uncrowned on remote peaks and public parks. And everything turns on these luminous petals and deep roots. This lily that thrives between spire and tree, whose brightness holds and glows beyond the life and border of its bloom. Hmm. I like that a lot. That's, um, yeah, that's lovely. And the evocation of the natural world and the, I suppose the natural order is in there somewhere and something of the majesty of the, the, the queen, the majesty of a monarch, the constancy in the most natural and benevolent way. It's kind of beautiful. Um, so I can set aside the history, the history book, and just enjoy enjoy the, uh, the poetic work. So Simon Armitage, thanks for that. Okay, that's it. 
that's um, <laughs> that's my I didn't think it was going to be so queen dominant but that's my tribute to the queen my thoughts um, a bit of history in the mix there a bit of politics a bit of a personal response um, and yeah and also the contribution from the, the Shamrock Rover fans in Tala last uh, Thursday thanks for that lads very very constructive input okay I'm done I'm done for another day another week you can throw me some love on social media if you wish. The Clear Out podcast is on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. The Clear Out 2 is on Twitter. And you can email me at theclearoutlive at gmail.com. If you want to make a contribution to this independent podcast, you can do so using the supporter link, which you will find in the description of this podcast. Or if you want to become a regular contributor, a patron if you will, of this show, this tell, this effort of mine, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the clear out. And I would welcome anything at all. It's the price of a, the price of a couple of bars of chocolate, a couple of star bars, <laughs> the price of a coffee, the price of a drink. Uh, once a month makes a, yeah, would be a, it would be a great help to what I'm doing here and a bit of a, a bit of a validation so uh, I welcome anything at all. But feel free to, to reach out on social media if you don't want to contribute anything financial. And just spread the love, spread the word. It would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Okay. And uh, I greatly appreciate you taking the time to listen, if you did, uh, for sticking with this. Uh, I will be back with more next week. All the best. Take care. Mind yourselves. I will talk to you soon. See ya. Bye.